In a world that glorifies the grind and celebrates the hustle that is characterized by just constant noise, a lot of times we can lose sight of the idea, let alone the very biblical idea that we are called to find rest, and that's a beautiful uh, gift of God uh, that we see just spoken over the narrative of scripture. Our, our world looks at us and says, busyness means you're successful, or you know, a full calendar means you're significant, or whatever. And that rest by its very nature means that you probably mismanage your time, or maybe even are just outright lazy and don't want the things that life really can present to you and the like, and yada, 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 yada. And you don't just have to have a side hustle, you got a side, side hustle, and a hustle. You know, I guess all the things that are such an interesting uh, progression of culture that even in my lifetime I've seen has just not in any way leveled out, that it is consistently being ratcheted up in its intensity. And the result of that, as you're all aware, is we're all real tired, uh, is the answer to that. Uh, and we need some rest. And for most of us, we're just making it from what, like, does anybody else feel like you collapse into the next thing? Is that a little too real? This one? You know what I'm talking about? Like, you're just like, I'm done with the next thing. Cool. Thanks for caffeine and the puppet strings it brings. I'm glad to be here. <laughs> like, that's like I feel going into everything in my life, seemingly. And this idea of Sabbath rest and what Scripture has to say about it, I think, has much to shape and change us if we will effectively step into it. Because, and this is a pretty intense statement, I think as a rhythmic biblical practice, this is the thing that Christianity, the church at large, does worst. Like, so if you're bringing in biblical practices of like prayer and diving into God's word and gathering together or worship, all these, like I think this, this Sabbath rest concept is the one we do the worst. But the beauty of that is, is that if we can even get this right partially, let alone completely, the dividends are exponential for our lives and the people around us for that matter. So with that in mind, turn with me to Exodus 20, verse 8, where we're going to look at uh, arguably the most popular instance of this idea of the Sabbath, which will be in the Ten Commandments, the Fourth Commandment specifically. Uh, if you need a copy of the Bible, we got physical copies in the back. Use the Bible app, Metro Community Church app as well. The notes are in there. Side note, you can cheat on those notes. Did you know that? All you got to do is type in like two letters, and it'll say, you want me to autofill? And you go, yes, please. Uh, and you can cheat, so you're welcome. Uh, there you go. But all that to be said, Exodus, the 20th chapter, 8th verse. It says this. It says, remember the Sabbath day uh, to keep it holy. You're to labor six days and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You must not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female servant, your livestock, or the resident alien who is within your city gates. For the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and everything in them in six days, then he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and declared it holy. And so if you think about Sabbath, if you've ever even come to like some understanding of this word at all, most likely the Ten Commandments and the Fourth Commandment specifically uh, are in view. Uh, the most notable instance of this that we see in our culture in time that you might can relate to it, from a term perspective that is very much tethered to this is sabbatical. Like going on a sabbatical is a uh, tether to the Hebrew word here, which we'll look at is either Shabbat or Shabbat in its different uh, contextual forms. And so that root word is scaled up even into what we know as sabbatical. Literally, in Leviticus 25, a Sabbath year is even instituted by God, where he says on the seventh year that all the people would rest for the whole year, which is both for them to be spiritually restored and renewed and for the land itself to be restored. And so that's where we get this concept of sabbatical, even though some of you are like, yeah, I'm familiar with the term, not the practice. Uh, right? You're like, my workplace doesn't institute that. That'd be fantastic. But that is where that concept comes from. And so that might be the closest thing to a normative cultural perspective we have on what that means. For so many of you, there might even be no understanding of Sabbath, like that word might be very new and just sound archaic and ancient in its context. And you ask the question of how does this, I didn't even know this had anything to do with my life, should it? I, I don't even understand. For those of you who've been raised in the church and some 
uh, fashion, whether that be just for a few years or maybe even decades, I imagine what I'm about to say is probably close to where you land with it. So we tend to say that people would think that the Lord's Day, as we refer to when we gather on Sundays, is the Sabbath day and is the day you worship and gather together and in so doing, by coming to church, you are in fact keeping it holy. So in doing this, then we believe that we've actually lived out this fourth commandment. So I'm going to need you to take that and wad it up and throw it out the window is what I need you to do today. Uh, Because while some of those things you will see are present in the biblical narrative, what I will tell you is traditionalism and the like has skewed it in its biblical intent. And so what we want to know, obviously, first and foremost as believers, or at least we should, is what does God's word declare about this for us, both in its initial intent in the formation of the very world, all the way up to what does it apply to me in a modern context as a Christian, a Christ follower in the wake of Jesus? So what does this look like for all of us? Now, I warn you in advance, uh, this one's going to be dense, Okay. Uh, real dense. So if you're new with us, we, we, we going into the paint today, all right? So you, like, just buckle up, like, just uh, put yourself in the headspace of you're, like, listening to this, like, long-form podcast vibe, all right? Like, that's where we're going with this, is going into some historical and biblical, quite frankly, minutia at times to give you a holistic understanding of what the Bible has to say about this. So with that in mind, we're hit looking at the what, and the why. What is Sabbath and why Sabbath, if it even is a thing that should matter? Don't get ahead of me, though, because for so many of us, the question is devoid of the what and the why. The answer for us is, yeah, but how? Because I feel like the answer is there ain't no how in my life. That's next week. So next week's the how in a practical sense. Today is what is it? Does it matter? Why does it matter? Okay? So, uh, We need to know, then, what that means for us. Now, we're going to start, as I typically do, we're going to start in Genesis, pretty much in creation. You seen a pattern here? Uh, We're going to start in Genesis and creation, move all the way to Revelation. I told you it was going to be, you know, uh, (laughs) pointed in a sense. And we're going to look at this. So we're going to start, then, in the Old Testament. So specifically, let's look at Genesis 2. Uh, Verse 1, it says this. So the heavens and the earth and everything in them were completed. On the seventh day, God had completed his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy, for on it he rested from all his work of creation. And that word for rested over and over again is shavath. And shavath is the verb form of this word, which translated in the Old Testament means a few things. It either means stop, to cease, to rest or outright means Sabbath, okay? So God was creating actively for six days and he stopped creating. He ceased creating and he rested. Later in scripture, uh, it blatantly says he rested and was rejuvenated. And I don't know how an omniscient being is rejuvenated because it doesn't give us any context as to how. It just says he was. And so this is what's in view at the foundation of the earth. We even heard it a few seconds ago whenever I read the fourth commandment because it's this created construct in Genesis 2 is even referenced then and elsewhere in when Sabbath's in view. So what we need to then understand pretty pointedly is that rest is established as good and perfect in the created order. When all the things were layered out before the fall, these are all things that were good and beautiful and perfect. Now, we talked about this a number of weeks ago, and quite frankly, for so many of you who've been with us for a season, uh, if you've ever had the experience when like, you're binge watching a show, and like the first few episodes, there's all this seemingly random stuff happening, and like the last two episodes, you're like, what is happening? All of it makes sense! Uh, and like, it comes together. You're going to have some of those moments in what we're doing today, and that is not by design other than God himself orchestrating it, okay? Meaning we're going to talk about God redeeming creation, as we said it a few weeks ago. We're going to hit stuff even from the Forgotten Footsteps series, if you were with us for that, and all these beautiful ways that God's scripture self-affirms it itself in these things. So with that in view, let's talk about the first of two realities we have to come to grips with and understand about Sabbath in the Old Testament if we then are going to understand what it means for us in the wake of the new. So the first concept that we have to come to grips with is Sabbath rest in the created order. 
We just saw in Genesis 2 that it in fact is created by God. He not only uh, like established it as a thing, but he himself self-prioritized it within his person. Now, here's what's cool. If you were with us for a few weeks ago, I'm gonna give you a quick spark notes if you weren't uh, on the screen of this idea of God redeeming creation. Now, hear me. You and I think about redemption through the specific redemption arc almost universally with the Bible as it applies to you and me. That Jesus, you know, we sinned, we have fallen short, we're in need of getting into a relationship with God, not by our own means, but through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And then we can now experience in part, which would be known as the abundant life in Christ, the beauty and power of God in a heavenward perspective. And once, one, one day when we go to be with God, we'll experience in full, okay? You think about that about you and me. But as we talked about in the redeeming of creation you know, deal, it's even creation itself. Like it even goes into Revelation. He's gonna redeem a whole new heaven and new earth. But what you might not realize is this is specifically like layered out with every single thing that is deemed good before the fall. Everything. God establishes something in the created order as good or perfect, something. Just fill in the blank with it. You and I, sure. We break the thing with sin. Jesus redeems and restores the thing through his sacrifice and followers of Christ experience the thing in part now and completely in heaven as he brings full restoration then, okay? So all that's in view. So let me give you some examples of other things in the created order that I'm talking about that this applies to. Work, you might not want to agree with this and you might wanna check my receipts on it. If you want to, Genesis 2.15, uh, work was established before the fall. It says God put Adam on the earth and to work the land. And this is pre-fall, okay? So work was established as good. And you're like, lies. Uh, it was. In its, in its initial conception, it was good, complete, not flawed. But what happens? Brokenness enters the world and your workplace pretty broke, right? All kinds of messed up stuff happens. You toil and experience pain and loss and failure, which we saw because of sin. It said in the curse to Adam, you will toil at the earth needlessly and it will produce thorns and thistles and failure enters the scene, even in the concept of work. We see Jesus do the completed work of the cross, and as we'll even study as we're gonna do a whole talk on Hebrews 4 that talks about eternal Sabbath, it also talks about the idea that in heaven our work is made complete through the act of what Christ did. So work itself comes full circle through that as well. Marriage is another one. Marriage is established before the fall even happens. You see that the only thing God looked at in creation and said was not good. He said he looked at everything, saw the man was alone, said this is not good, and brought into it this relationship that we call marriage. And it's declared as such in that instance. It says this is why a man leaves his family, cleaves to his wife in marriage. And that conceptual idea is even foundational there. Let's bring it further. Uh, the fall happens and the fall happened because two people got married and acted a fool. Okay? Like they just didn't do what they should. They got a squabble over something and inevitably, boom, we take this whole fruit thing and it screws up everything. That's right. Marriage was both the gift and the curse uh, in and of itself. And some of you don't, don't say amen to that out loud. Uh, but as we move forward in the narrative, we see broken marriages and pain throughout the entirety of the biblical narrative. But when we get to Jesus and he restores things, what is Jesus constantly throughout the New Testament described as? The bridegroom, and we are the bride. And he wants to, in Revelation, come down and then present us as holy and blameless before the Father. And so marriage is an in-part vision and experience of that which we will feel and experience in whole through Christ. You've seen this? It's all these things. You want another? Here we go. Food. Food's another one. When you look at food in the narrative, it says, look, Adam was given dominion of the earth and to take and eat and consume. And it says, God says, hey, you can eat of anything in the garden. Just don't eat of the knowledge, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so he says, don't eat of that. Well, guess what we do? Create sin. And then all these crazy things start happening around food. You have uh, sins of gluttony and the light coming into effect. You even have holiness laws that we'll talk about a little bit today, speaking to the idea of these specific things you should or should not eat. And with all this stuff, we sit back and see that Jesus is then described as the bread of what? 
life. We see beyond that when we celebrate the Lord's Supper that we take of the bread and we said, this is his body that was broken for me. We take this in remembrance of him and we consume it. And then we see that we will one day never hunger, never thirst. We will be without disease or death one day when we are with him. Do you understand the absurd beauty of the narrative of scripture here? This is what's in view. And another thing that he establishes on the seventh day is what? Rest. And so what we're going to do is take those things that I just did with those others and in detail scale that up throughout Scripture and see how God redeems that. But the first thing you need to get here then is that uh, according to God, Sabbath obviously matters and is prioritized by him. And I'm going to use very specific terms, and you don't need to let them skirt by you without getting them. Matters and prioritize are specific words I'm using, and we will shift those later. But for now, make sure you understand the nuance definition there. I didn't say he mandates. I said he, it matters to him, and he prioritized it. So the first point for you, and I'm going to try to make sure that these, for the most part, are with these wide conceptual things we're doing are broken down in some pretty easy-to-consume uh, points is this, stopping and resting is a foundational part of God's created order, period. It's foundational part of it. God himself did it and viewed it as a good thing. So stopping to rest matters conceptually, and even in some kind of specific practice, if we want our lives to reflect his perfect created order, should at least stand out that it probably should matter and be prioritized by us as well if we want to be more like God, let alone as we get further down this road like Jesus. So the second thing then that we see in the Old Testament we don't need to miss is ritualistic Sabbath observance. So you have Sabbath in the created order, and then later on the Mosaic Law shows up, and there's a lot of real specific things around the Sabbath. Now, side note, if you haven't gathered, it says that Sabbath was on the what? The seventh Day, which the calendar to this very day scales up just as it is back then. So what day of the week is Sabbath then by that measure? Saturday. It's Saturday. So the, the landing point for this message is all you people got to start coming to Saturday night services. We're, gonna, we're, we're closing these services down. I'm deeply convicted. But nah, that's not, like, we, that's, that, right? Like that should elicit within us some questions. Like, okay, if Sabbath was Saturday and we think we're going to gather on Sunday, let's ask some questions about what that means. And this begun, be, becomes this rhythmic fashion of observant on Saturdays within the Mosaic Law in this ritualistic Sabbath. Now, we're gonna read Exodus 16 right now. It's the first time it showed up, which is even before the Ten Commandments. And in that instance, this is where there's a new version of this word used. Before it was Shabbat, the verb, and now it is Shabbat, the noun. And that noun is to talk about, and when it's used, the ritualistic understanding of the Jewish people adhering to Sabbath in a weekly rhythm, okay? So it's the first time it shows up, Exodus 16. What's happening here, and here's where we have another moment like this, this is literally on the heels of what we talked about in the Forgotten Footsteps series, that they're on the other side of the Red Sea being parted, uh, and they are, you know, have worshiped God and all this, and then all of a sudden God enacts this miracle where he presents manna from heaven so they can eat, and that's where we pick up in verse 21. They gathered it, it being manna, every morning. Each gathered as much as he needed to eat, but when the sun grew hot, it melted, and on the sixth day, they gathered twice as much food, four quarts apiece. And all the leaders of the community came and reported this to Moses. He told them, this is what the Lord has said. Tomorrow is a day of complete rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you want to bake and boil what you want to boil and set aside everything left over to be kept until morning. So they set it aside until morning, as Moses commanded, and it didn't stink or have maggots in it. Well, that's good. Uh, it, <laughs> eat it today, Moses said, because today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you won't find any in the field. For six days you will gather it, but on the seventh day, Sabbath, there will be none. Yet on the seventh day, this is so the Israelite people, what they would do, it even goes back to the way we're in the garden. Did he really say this, though? Did he really say you should do this? Yet on the seventh day, some of the people went out to gather, but they did not find any. 
Then the Lord said to Moses, how long will you refuse to keep my commands and instructions? Understand that the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, on the sixth day, he will give you two days worth of bread. Each of you stay where you are. No one is to leave his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. Now, something to take of note that we'll be revisiting next week is that you and I a lot of times assume that we just can't find rest uh, for any number of reasons. How, did, did you take note of on the day before the Sabbath what they had to do? Was it a normal day or did it say they had to collect twice as much on that day so they were even capable of Sabbathing on the next? That's what's in view. Now, as we scale this into the fourth commandment, this is something you gotta understand that I don't think we wrestle with, with the Sabbath. We go, yeah, it's just this day of rest and honor to God. We'll see in a little bit. I'll present to you some of the things they would do, like gathering together, presenting the law, different consecrating sacrifices and the like. All that's great. But when we look at this, this concept of rest isn't just rest as we understand it. It's resting in God's sovereignty and power because they're an agrarian culture, meaning that they are... Uh, foundationally in a space where agriculture is paramount to their survival. And this was something that set them apart and made a statement about them that the rest of the pagan world at large would not ever understand and was unique to them. The idea that truly, like they had laws that you couldn't even put like a bundle of sticks on your shoulder and walk around with it, even past a certain weight and everything. And it was to say that if you looked out of your tent or if once they were established as a people and had homes, and you saw that your field was on fire, you don't go put it out. If you saw that wolves were eating all your sheep, you just let them get eaten by the sheep. Why? Because it is a day of full surrender, going everything I have belongs to God. And even watching myself look like I'm going into destitution is something that I can cling to the power of Almighty and know that he is sovereign over it. And that was wildly counterintuitive to the culture of the world at large. Why, how? You are gonna give up a seventh of your entire year of work? And then later, as I even told you in Leviticus 25, they're gonna say, you also give up a whole year? This is wild, this is counterintuitive. This doesn't make sense. It's what God says, you, go, you come to me, you give your first, and you give it all, and you give it to me because I'm worthy and I am powerful and I am one who can be relied upon. So that's what's in view here. And then we see it scale into the 10 commandments and specifically the fourth in Exodus 20 as we looked at earlier, which I'll reread real quick just for reference. It says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. You're to labor six days and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You must not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female servant, your livestock, or the resident alien who is in your city gates, for the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and everything in them in six days. Then he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and declared it holy. So we see there a tether point to the original created order we talked about. We'll actually see that again in a little bit in Exodus 31. And again, it shows up in Hebrews 4 that we'll study in this series as well, both in the context of the old Mosaic law and projectionally in our eternal Sabbath in Hebrews 4 that we find in and through Christ one day, okay? So that's what's all in view here. And what I need you to understand, and I say this a lot, and it is scalable throughout the entirety of Scripture, is that the order of things matters, So I'm gonna make a statement to you about what this is saying that Jesus himself will say a lot better than I'm about to say in a lot more non-confusing way. But this tongue twister is one that we need to understand, and it's this. It's my most convoluted point, foreshadowing. The fourth commandment, ritualistic Sabbath observance, is defined by the created order, meaning it came first and it was foundational to what then was more formed and focused in the fourth commandment. But the fourth commandment does not retroactively define or redefine the created order, okay? And that is paramount to our theological, biblical, and practical understanding of what this means for you and I today. Because the question is, did when the fourth commandment, did it redefine in such a way that in perpetuity it could only ever then look like the fourth commandment? You with me? Instead of it being like it was all the time leading up to that. 
And the answer is, is that the foundational created order of good did not change because a ritualistic practice was established. Does it mean that it wasn't something within that time and scope that God gave to his people for very specific reasons, as we'll see? This means that God's prioritization of Sabbath rest is not dictated or controlled in perpetuity by the specific stipulations laid out in the Mosaic Law, foreshadowing, as we'll see Jesus blatantly say. The fourth commandment also is a side note, and this is what we have to begin to do, is distinguish between, when you study the old law, what is holiness consecration law and what is moral law. Now, the most notable of which is when it blatantly says, this is to set you apart and make you holy. Something that says, hey, we're going to do this and no culture around us does it to show that we rely on God. Another example of that would be the kosher laws that they had in place. And even some Jews did observe to this very day. Of we're going to only eat certain things because of these stipulations of holiness law that you and I, obviously, in a modern church sh- uh, setting, don't do. And there's reason for those things things. Uh, If you look into the New Testament, Peter has an interaction with God where in a vision God brings down on a sheet every animal conceivable and he says, Peter, why do you call that which I have made clean unclean because of the issues and struggles Peter had with placating to Judaizers, people who had been previously Jewish and who are now followers of Christ who are going, yeah, but I think we need to also do all the Jewish Mosaic law as well. He goes, no, not so. And we're going to see Paul speak to that in very pointed fashion in the epistles here in just a bit. But of note is that when we know it to be moral law that transcends just the Ten Commandments or the Mosaic Law is when we see it affirmed in the New Testament, especially by Jesus, to be such. So a great example would be, shocker, uh, they circle back to don't murder people in the New Testament. And they make us clear that like, it didn't change like at all. Uh, Jesus even goes on beyond that. He says, you've heard it said, do not murder. I say that when you have hatred and, and just vitriol towards your brother, that you are guilty of the same thing. He just even takes it further. So Jesus doesn't just establish those things at times. He even brings it further. The only commandment of the 10 that is not reaffirmed in specific moral framing of this is required of you, and that's a key term there, is the fourth commandment and the Sabbath and keeping it holy. Exodus 31, 12 gives us some insight into what that is and the way it was framed in the Mosaic law. It says, the Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites, specific obviously, you must observe my Sabbaths for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations so that you will know that I am the Lord who consecrates you, sets you apart, makes you holy, holiness law. Observe the Sabbath for it is holy to you. Whoever profanes it must be put to death. That's right, that was a consequence of it. We're going to be instituting that soon. Uh, No, Uh, your attendance matters at Metro. Your life depends on it. Uh, No, if anyone does work on it, that person must be cut off from his people. Work may be done for six days, but on the seventh day, there must be a Sabbath of complete rest, holy to the Lord. He's going to say it again. Anyone who does work on the Sabbath day must be put to death. Yea, the Israelites must observe the Sabbath, celebrating it throughout their generations. It's a permanent covenant. It is a sign forever between me and the Israelites. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, but on the seventh day, he rested and was refreshed. So once again, a retroactive reference even to the created order. Things of note, we've already really said, but I'm gonna repeat myself at times in this message so we can double down on some things and not miss them is this is within the establishment of the Mosaic Law specifically. It is very specifically spoken to the Israelites and spoken directly as a consecration law that makes them holy and set apart. Of note, it was punishable by death. And side note, I don't know if you've talked to or interacted with anybody of a Jewish faith background. They're not killing people if they don't show up to church on Saturdays, okay? Uh, Or, you know, it's, it's... Not happening. So even we see up into the time of Jesus that even some of those laws have shifted as they were not uh, applying the, you know, capital punishment to the idea of that. You saw that whenever the Israelites, you're not asking for this, but here's just some Bible geek. Uh, Whenever you see them get scattered and all that and different governments took over, a lot of these very specific judiciary enactments went away because they now found themselves in subjugation to a higher political authority, okay? So that's what's in view there. It's shifted in those times, And then obviously had changed now that you have a Roman uh, government and oversight in the time of Jesus even. 
So a comparable example, as we talked about then, to what's being presented here, as we will even see retroactively referenced in the New Testament as well, is holiness laws around what you eat, kosher laws, and the likes. Now, things that happened on the Sabbath day in the Old Testament were additional sacrifices and offerings. We see that in Numbers and Leviticus. Reading and teaching of the Torah. Rest and reflection we see even in Exodus. Communal gatherings of worship in Leviticus. Prophetic and priestly involvement. Singing and music. All these different things that should sound a little familiar. Why? Because it's so much of what we even do as Christians as we gather on Sundays in even a modern context. So we're going to see that there is some thematic and traditional scaling that happens throughout the entirety of the scope of history leading to us today. So while it's helpful to see it framed in a way that is specifically spoken to the Israelites, which is great, we do technically need more for it to have been changed as its application applies to us. So let's ask the pointed questions that you and I hopefully are wrestling with about this type of uh, topic. One, has Jesus changed our understanding and application of the Sabbath as we take the turn into the New Testament? Luke 4, 16 says this, and this is an interesting one. He came, he being Jesus, to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, so his hometown. As usual, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. So we hear here that Jesus' rhythm was to attend and engage with the Sabbath. It was his uh, rhythmic thing that he did, and he would do it and show up and teach. We'll even see in the early church in a little bit the idea that the uh, different apostles and the like would show up and preach and teach about Jesus in the Sabbath in the Jewish synagogues. Pretty controversial, as you can imagine, very consistently. So this is something that's happening, but we need to make note here, and it's this. Jesus observed the Sabbath. He did. Jesus did. So we see then that it is a priority and a practice of Jesus. See, he practiced and prioritized Sabbath, so to be more like him which is what sanctification is, meaning to become more and more like Jesus daily, is to also prioritize and practice Sabbath. And I'm using those words very specifically. I didn't say mandated universal attendance, which, P.S., not a popular thing for the preacher to say. I need to be looking in these scriptures to tell you that you can't ever vacation ever. You have to be here all the time. Sorry. Uh, you know, you may have been in church growing up where they even gave you, like, pins whenever you, like, had perfect attendance in the year and stuff like that, right? Like, we're going to start doing that. Uh, no. Uh, right? So Luke 4, 16 establishes that it was a priority to him. And we're going to look next week at the way he lived this out. He would do this through consistent times of solitude. He would do it through rest and repose. He would do rhythmic stopping for prayer and reflection that all existed outside of the Saturday Sabbath and also rhythmically within. So, the question then is, just because Jesus prioritized it, does it mean it is required of Christians? Mark 2, 23 says, speaks to this, and this is arguably the single most poignant and powerful passage as it applies to our understanding of the Sabbath and the entirety of Scripture, okay? So 23, on the Sabbath, he, being Jesus, was going through the grain fields, and his disciples began to make their way, picking some heads of grain. And the Pharisees said to him, this is more or less what they said, gotcha, Uh, that's what they thought they were about to say. Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath, meaning they're picking and working this grain? The Pharisees were so intense and legalistic with this that they would go as far as to say in some uh, specific sects of their uh, following that if you spit into the dirt, that your you know, liquid saliva uh, mixing with the dry dirt, if it made mud, that you worked and therefore sinned, okay? That's how intense. They would even use a comparative nature of some of the like bundle of sticks that were talked about in the old Mosaic law to determine the exact weight in which you could not lift to still be in sin or out of sin. So very legalistic in their framing. So they're looking to Jesus to go, ha, gotcha. And they think they've got him. And Jesus is gonna say something pretty crazy, as he tends to do. He said to them, have you never read what David and those who were with him did when he was in need and hungry? So he's referencing a tale, a narrative of King David from previous generations. How he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar, the high priest, and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for anyone to eat except the priests, and also gave some to his companions. Then he told them, the, this is it, these, these next two sentences are where it completely shifts. The Sabbath 
was made for man, not man for the Sabbath, which to be clear is Jesus saying in a more simple and appropriate way that I said much more convoluted and complex earlier. So I said the fourth commandment is defined by the created order, but the fourth commandment does not define the created order. Jesus said this far more poignantly when he says the Sabbath was made for man, a gift from God embodied and lived out by God as a thing to show us that it's a gift for us and it is not something that we are supposed to be enslaved to, entrapped by, and walk legalistically framed within. So the final statement then is this, and this is a statement of dominion and authority that Jesus self-reflects on. This is the stuff I always talk about when I say Jesus is not some decent dude who just like put good vibes in the world. It was just some prophet. He's either a complete heretic and charlatan who was at the center of the single greatest conspiracy in the history of mankind, or he's God, okay? Just one or the other. Column A, column B. And I'm pretty obviously in the camp that he's God. And right here, he says as such. He says, so then the Son of Man is Lord even over the Sabbath, declaring his authority and sovereignty over even the conceptual created order and the Mosaic law. So with that in view, this is the point for you. Jesus established his authority over both the created order and ritualistic understanding of the Sabbath. It's both and. He goes, yeah, that was all the New Old Testament. It's all beautiful and great. Uh, I'm over all that. I am Lord of the Sabbath. And as we're gonna see in a little bit, he's gonna say, I am your rest. Hebrews 4, 1 says this in the projectional nature. So we know now that God, through the power of Christ, has given us rest through the person and sacrifice of Jesus, but what does that mean long term? As I've already foreshadowed about a 10 times, Hebrews 4, 1 says this, Therefore, since the promise to enter his rest remains, meaning to be with him one day in paradise, let us beware that none of you be found to have fallen short, meaning that you do not have faith in Jesus to enter that rest. And then you move forward to nine, and it says, therefore, a Sabbath rest remains for God's people. For the person who has entered his rest has rested from his own works, just as God did from his retroactive, uh, effective focus on the created order. Let us then make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will fall into the same pattern of disobedience. So we see here then that not only is Jesus Lord of the Sabbath, that he has redefined all that and has authority over it all, we have this beautiful gift in that we have an eternal Sabbath rest in Christ. What we now know in part, we will then know in full. So how then did the early church discuss and enact and interact with the ritualistic understanding of the Sabbath. In Paul's letter to the Colossians, in chapter two, verse 16, he says this, therefore, don't let anyone judge you in regard to food and drink, or in the matter of festivals, or a new moon, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of what was to come. The substance is Christ. That sentence right there, theologically paramount, okay? He goes, look, This Mosaic law, these things, because new moon festivals and all those other things were also spoken to as consecrations in the Mosaic law, those were all a foreshadowing, a looking forward to that which is to come, both temporarily in the abundant life in Christ today and completely in the eternal Sabbath with him one day in heaven. But the beauty is that the substance is Christ. Romans 14, one says this, welcome anyone who is weak in faith, but don't argue about disputed matters. One person believes he may eat anything, while one who is weak eats only vegetables. Shots fired, veggies. <laughs> I didn't write it, I'm just reading it. Uh, one who eats must not look down on one who does not eat, and one who does not eat must not judge one who does, because God has accepted him. Who are you to judge another household servant before his own Lord he stands or falls? And he will stand because the Lord is able to make him stand. One person judges one day to be more important than the other. So hopefully you're seeing this. We're seeing the like kosher laws being discussed here. And we're also seeing the like holiness days laws being discussed here. Another day. Someone else judges every day to be the same. Let each one, which we'll see in a second, because in the Acts church, they gathered together every single day and set it apart as as something to be done for the Lord. Let each one be fully convinced in his own mind, 
Whoever observes the day observes it for the honor of the Lord. Whoever eats, eats for the Lord, since he gives thanks to God. And whoever does not eat, it is for the Lord that he does not eat. And he gives thanks to God. So the motivation of our heart as is tethered to the substance of Christ is what matters. So the point here is this. Because of Jesus, ritualistic adherence to the Sabbath being this, uh, you know, consecration, holiness law of Moses was not enforced in the early church. It wasn't. And there were people who were trying to make sure it was. So, the intention then has shifted towards the work of Jesus, even in the book of Acts on the Sabbath. I'm not going to go into it, but I had a number of quotes even from early church fathers. Ignatius of Antioch is one who uh, wrote on this a good bit. But in 8160 to 180, when he kind of was a, a leader in the church, which is literally barely 100 years removed from Jesus, he spoke to this idea of this shift into what is declared to be the Lord's Day. Now, we only see that phrase show up once in Scripture, and it's in Revelations whenever John is about to have this vision of the end times, and it says that it was on the Lord's Day that this word from God came to him. And most theologians believe that that's speaking to this idea of Sunday. And why then Sunday? Anybody have an indicator of why we as Christians celebrate Sunday? Because it's when Jesus what? Rose from the grave. And we said that we celebrate and reflect on the day that Sabbath was made complete. I could even go into all kinds of crazy stuff too if I went into that, right? So like we even talked about it back at the Easter series whenever the people uh, uh, that were in the wake of Jesus' death, keep in mind too, what day did Jesus die and rest? It was Saturday. Side note, if you want to get wigged out even more, and it also says that his followers went and observed the Sabbath day on that time while the Pharisees went and worked in their hypocrisy. It was crazy. So you see all of these things happening throughout this. So the question then behooves us, I haven't used that one in a sentence in a long time, what day should the Sabbath be observed then as we bring things to a close? See, originally, as we said, the Jewish Sabbath was on a Saturday, but this Lord's Day shows up. And it's because we see that the early church started showing up and gathering on the first day of the week. Acts 20, it says, on the first day of the week, in verse 7, we assembled to break bread. Paul spoke to them, and since he was about to depart the next day, he kept on talking until midnight. 1 Corinthians 16, we see them gather in that regard, and others as well. And we can gather this. There's an emphasis then, not a mandate, on gathering on the first day of the week, the Lord's Day in the early church. The communal gatherings for numerous God-focused purposes, but not adherence to the ritualistic, traditional understanding of the Sabbath within the Jewish community. Additionally, it was clear that this wasn't a universal mandate of when they gathered. In Acts 2, we see every day the early church gathering together and celebrating what God was doing with no specific emphasis on one day. See, Christian worship on Sunday is a celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's very important to remember, though, Sunday worship is not commanded in the Bible, and Sunday has not replaced Saturday and become some version of the Christian Sabbath. While the New Testament describes Christians gathering and worshiping on Sundays, it nowhere states that Sunday has replaced Saturday as a Sabbath. That's why we have churches, we even have a church in St. Louis that meets on Wednesdays. That's the day they meet. It's because they understand this reality to be such that it's not the day that matters, it's the practice that does of finding rest and communal worship and love in and through the power of Christ. John 10, 7 says this, and I, please bear with me in this last section because this is the landing point of it all. Verse seven, Jesus said again, truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep didn't listen to them. I am the gate. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. 10, a thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come so that they may have life and have it in abundance. Church, what I want for you and for me is the abundant life in Christ. I want it. I don't want to settle for just skirting by on grace and high-fiving God when I walk through the gates. I want to enact and live a life that is worshipful, that is characterized by this abundant life in Christ. And this abundant life is something that is a consistent thing 
of living out in abundance. Everything from the fruits of the Spirit to all the things that God promises us, saying, yes, I'm gonna step into that. Because hear me, you don't have You don't have to choose the abundant life of God. You don't have to step into the power of God. You don't have to. You can walk in such a way that you go, I am freed by the power of Jesus, but I am still going to constantly allow myself to be controlled by anxiety and riddled by all kinds of things. I won't find joy. I'm not gonna find peace in him. I'm not gonna find this abundance that I can have. I believe it, and I'll come back to those concepts here and there, but there is no consistency and uh, moving runway to heaven that goes, man, I wanna experience as much of heaven today as I can even before I get there. Friends, I want that. I want abundance in my life. And when we look at the abundant life, we then have to look at what Jesus did, how he lived, and what he seeks to be for us. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says this, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me because I'm lowly and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Finally, abundant life in Christ is finding sustainable rest in Christ through daily surrender and rhythmic practice. As I was processing this with Taylor, even between services. This is how this nonsense just flows out of that woman. She said this. She said, Seth, remind them this. He offers us the gift of salvation, but he also offers us the gift of himself each day. That is what you have in Sabbath rest in Christ Jesus, is the gift of a God who modeled it first, both in the created order, both in the manifestation of his perfect son. And if we want to experience the abundant life in Christ, then we have to come to grips with the idea that we might have to change a lot so that we can be changed a lot and actually find rest. So hopefully you see today that Sabbath rest is finding ourselves to be surrendered to the power and person of Jesus Christ, both wholly, daily, and rhythmically. And we're going to talk about next week what that rhythm and practice looks like within the construct of Scripture and the early church and how we can, in fact, apply that to our lives. But it's going to, I pray this week, because it's going to require change of you and of me if we want to actually have that. So let's be ones who this week are in prayer about that, who reflect on it and come back prepared to be changed by it. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you and I love you. I thank you that you have modeled this Sabbath rest in our lives first and foremost. And that you've shown us that we can have this gift. And while you don't say, hey, you are in a forcible, legalistic, must do this, must have perfect attendance or you're in sin or whatever. You have in the power and person of Jesus, the substance that is him from the foreshadowing of everything that was and the looking forward to everything that will be, that he is our Sabbath. He is our rest. So may we prepare our hearts even now as we begin this journey together to figure out how to practically find rest in you, Jesus. You are worthy of our praise. You are worthy of our song. And we seek to find rest for our very souls in you. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.